the past is a mirage I left far behind. It's a, a sort of multi-layered, multi-faceted project, and uh, perhaps every artist might say those words, um, but in this case, there's this kind of physical manifestation of of different layers and different facets. So it's uh, seven screens that refract images and um, and sort of unfold them or double them or triple them. Uh, and on these sculptures are projected a history of abstraction from um, from now back through the 20th century. And um, the the projections are a kind of become a kind of collage. They're shown in reverse, upside down, and backwards. Um, although the sound continues forward, and the, each uh, season there'll be a different grouping of these films, and they represent a kind of subjective history of abstraction. Uh, typically, the the history of abstraction in film is always confined to s short periods when people were doing it for a particular reason in a particular place. This is kind of looking at it as a broad um, history and kind of collapsing and overlaying different moments of history um, and perhaps, let's say, uh, yeah, expanding them into something new now. Uh, the project began a few years ago in the sense that I had, in uh, following up an investigation I've been working on for the past 15 years, which is trying to understand how, what is the difference between the idea of an image in the mind versus the actual image that's created on a, on a mirror. So typically, a mirror is sort of like a window into another world, but it's actually f always created by a physical uh, process of physical material which has particular um, uh, qualities to it and I started to think about whether the same was true of a screen so you know screens are kind of absolutely ubiquitous now in our life in so many different ways and yet we don't really think of them as an object we think of them as what kind of image they create in their mind so in our minds so what um, I was thinking about whether you could turn the screen into a physical object where you could disrupt it or expand it or dismantle it and have it create something that would change, would stay in one sense true to the original image but in another sense um, reassemble it into something new. What was exciting about when I was approached by the Whitechapel Gallery uh, to do this commission was a series of um, things about the Whitechapel's history that I found especially fascinating. I uh, the relationship of the institution itself to the neighborhood and to the history of uh, uh, labor movements and other things like that and the idea of um, education as a kind of cross-class enterprise. Uh, there was also this history of this idea of enlightenment and the idea that the library was a lantern for learning and there's these c series of windowed rooms within and windows that uh, go out on the street or the ceiling that had uh, colored panels and this idea sort of in my mind I, of a building built to project light out into the neighborhood. Um, and so I thought about how to uh, reverse that and have this light being projected and refracted within the space and thinking about abstraction as a kind of um, ideal of an enlightenment, of a new understanding of the world, um, and how could we, even though that perhaps that's a discredited notion, how could we come back to that and find a way forward through the idea of abstraction itself. After 1925, there's much more of a tendency with modernist impulses to start from scratch, for, start from this clean slate, which I think is very um, disturbing in many ways and so this idea of, of imagining a new world uh, that still encompasses its own history um, uh, is sort of in the building itself and then the fact that it's this this building of um, you know brick and these um, articulated or, or um, ornamented columns and the fact that it's an historic building led me to come up with the idea of the strategies used uh, in various design exhibitions over the 20th century of temporary um, temporary structures that can be inserted in tension with the floor and the ceiling as a way of making something that's very architectural and yet doesn't disturb the building at all um, in terms of any permanent sense. 
The mirrored aspect of the sculptures are twofold. One is on the side where the projection is happening, and then on the side where the projection is not happening. And on the side where it's not happening, it kind of changes the space and changes one's ability to navigate the space easily in the sense that you see these, these panels of mirror and you're not exactly sure whether you're looking through them or looking at something from behind. So there's a kind of um, slight disorientation that they generate. And then on the side where the projection is happening, they're used to, um, in a couple of different ways, one is to essentially extend the image. So um, basically, there, there are a number of mirrors where they are at right angles to the projection cloth on which the projection is happening. And this extends the image in different ways. And sometimes it's to the right, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, and sometimes it's into a sort of theoretical infinite um, expansion left and right. It's a dimly lit space. Because of that, um, the, you, you sense that you're part of the, sh the exhibition and the projectors are placed in such a way that sometimes you're blocking the image and you're adding your own image in order to really look at it. And so then you become a sort of another abstract form within this. And then as you're looking at the, around the um, exhibition, your, your view is, let's say, not blocked, but uh, other visitors are adding their kind of image to your image of the vista. And because the light is behind them, for instance, then they become very kind of stark silhouettes. So in some literal sense, it's really about the people looking at these things as opposed to them, the, the things themselves. And because it's a projection, what's happening is constantly temporary, and constantly changing, so that emphasizes perhaps even more the fact that it's really, it's about the people who are there and their perception more than it is about the thing as a kind of um, independent object. One could criticize the exhibition because it collapses history in the sense of it's saying that something that was done in 2007 might be comparable to something done in 1936 and these are very different moments of history and political conditions and cultural conditions. Um, so, but that's sort of part of the point. It's not to collapse history and to say that histor history doesn't have any kind of um, weight to it, but more that we can reassemble and recollage history um, in order to better understand the present. So that that the idea of that you remember the past, but the past could be malleable in the sense that it can be used to reassemble new meanings. And so in light of that, and um, I wanted there to be a series of other voices in the exhibition, and that this happens in two ways. One is, is that the films that are the source material for these kind of visual collages are sort of anybody who has made um, abstract film in the, in the past 90 years. And then the people who are picking the kind of sequence, this subjective history, are other voices, so in the uh, other, um, let's say, art historians or artists or artist collectives um, or other critics and scholars. And then the first one is, is somebody who's actually kind of, could be described as all of the above, uh, Kenneth Goldsmith, who's a concrete poet, uh, a kind of archivist, a scholar, an artist, uh, a collective, uh, in and of himself in some sense. And so he is the founder of UbuWeb, which is an archive of, of, um, of uh, film and music that's of freely available on the web. And um, so he chose his very partisan um, kind of history of abstraction from 2007 to 1936. And he really emphasized in some sense how abstraction is still a kind of modality that's occurring now in an ongoing way, um, as opposed to a history that's stuck in, in the past. There's something um, that, with abstraction, that allows you to both think and to sense with the body in a way where you can, for a, a moment, let go of, of um, one's normal train of thought and perhaps shift, at least for a second, the direction of one's thought. So it's, abstraction seems to me like it still has this incredible possibility, even though it's in some sense been tainted by its association with various things that have happened in the history of the 20th century.